Welcome to another inspirational message from Chowdean Community Church, Gateshead. For more information about Chowdean, visit www.chowdean.org.uk. We hope you enjoy the podcast. James has never had it so good and so quiet in the last couple of weeks. But uh, I do hope that my voice holds out and that you'll be able to hear me. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, Daniel has always been one of my heroes of the Bible. Ever since I was in Sunday school many years ago, um, I'd love to hear about his amazing faith and his courage and that of his friends. I love to hear how his friends refused to bow down and worship an idol and were thrown into a fiery furnace. Hopefully. Hopefully on the screen behind me. Perhaps not. Only to be miraculously kept safe from harm and walk out of the furnace without even the smell of smoke on them. When the people who were stoking the fire and throwing them in actually died from the excessive heat. And as a child, it was great to hear how Daniel was kept safe when he was thrown into the lion's den because he refused to stop praying to God. These stories are the stories of legends. And as an adult, when telling children, I still get a thrill. It's amazing. But you know, as a child, and probably even as an adult, Since then, I haven't really given a thought to the man himself, his character, or those of his friends. I've never really thought about what he'd gone through. I've never really thought about what he was really like. I never really thought what he and his friends managed to achieve in really challenging circumstances, and why he acted the way he did. In preparing this talk, I've had the opportunity to look at how we lived and what a huge impact that had. And then look at the lessons we can learn today from him. One thing that did strike me, and I don't know whether it struck you before, is the striking similarities between his life and Joseph's life. Both of them prospered in foreign lands after being taken there against their will. Both were elevated to high office. Both gained respect for themselves and were trusted by their captors. So, to recap where we are, Daniel and his friends, who were all young men in the prime of their life, were taken captive into Babylon. And last week, I mean, I wasn't here, but I listened to the podcast, Paul talked us through some of the problems that the young men faced and how, despite everything, they had retained their integrity and decided to take the path of impacting on those around rather than setting out to be impressed. And I loved it when Paul quoted, Dare to be a Daniel. You remember the old Dare to be a Daniel. Now I think it's fair to assume that none of them wanted to be where they were or would have chosen to be in Babylon. Probably, like most young people today, they had their life mapped out in front of them. And it almost certainly did not include being taken prisoners into an enemy country. But they did find themselves in this situation, and it couldn't have been a nice surprise at all. Things go wrong in life, my voice for one. And how we react is often a huge witness to those around us. Now, who remembers the church we came away a few years back when the heating went off? It was cold, wasn't it? It was cold. And I know I'm probably a bit weird. Actually, I'm probably a lot weird. But I couldn't help but think this is an amazing opportunity for us as a church to be a witness. Not to throw all our toys out the pram, demand money back. The hotel did an amazing 
amazing job. They couldn't help the fact that a bit of machinery went wrong, and they did their very, very best to put it right. But what an amazing opportunity for us as a church to witness that we don't react like everybody else does. Because people notice how you react. I was standing in the queue in Boots the other day, and it was a very long queue, and there were two people who were absolutely rushed off their feet. And as I was standing in the queue, all I could hear was the people behind me. Oh, this is ridiculous. <laughs> moaning and groaning and groaning. And all I could see was the person doing their very best to serve the customers as quickly and as pleasantly as they could. So when I got to them, I went, oh, you're having a really busy day. She went, oh, tell me about it. And we had a bit of banter. And I thought that poor woman was doing her best. What a witness would it have been if I'd have started moaning along with everybody else. Now, I used to be a customer services manager. I used to employ a lot of staff. Um, and there were tiers, sort of, so we had officers, assistants, team leaders, um, and so on and so forth, before they got to me. So that by the time a customer got to me, if they were making a complaint, they wanted blood. They were not going to, by the time they got to me, they'd gone through everybody else who hadn't answered their problem, and they wanted blood. And because of that, you know, I'm hopeless at complaining. I can't complain because I know what it's like to be doing your absolute darndest to help somebody and all they do is scream and shout at you. And I think we have to be very, very careful not to fall into that trap. But did Daniel and his friends react like that when they found themselves in a situation they weren't expecting? Did they help the mother of all tactics? God, I didn't ask for this. This isn't fair. Why is this happening to me? Nope. They quietly got on with life. And wow, what an impact that had on the lives around them. But what exactly did Daniel and his friends do? Well, I think that what they did can be completely summed up in one wonderful verse, found in Micah 6, verse 6. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love, and to walk humbly with your God. Basically, they did three things, all of which is found in that verse. And the first was, they were humble. They were humble. One of the biggest things that they did was to walk humbly. They didn't flaunt themselves about. It does say in the Bible that they were good looking lads, and they could have been proud of that. But they didn't let it go to their head. When they got there, the first problem they faced was that they were supposed to eat non kosher food, which for a Jew was a real They didn't have a fit about it, though, and throw a tantrum. No, they calmly and politely asked if they could be allowed to eat their own diet and prove it would not have a detrimental effect on their health. And again, when Daniel was asked to tell Nebuchadnezzar his dream and interpret it, he didn't take any of the glory when he successfully did this, but instead he gave all the glory to God. Now, I think sometimes we can have a misguided view of what humble really means. The dictionary says, having or showing a modest or low estimate of one's importance. But I think that makes you sound worthless, spineless, and of no impact. The Bible has Daniel's humility was what I like to call realistic humility. Realistic humility. Now, don't get me wrong, no one should be parading themselves around saying, look at me, and acting like proud peacocks. They should be putting others first, not themselves. 
After all, it does say in Romans 12, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. But, but, it then goes on to say, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Realistic humility. Think of yourself with sober judgment. God has given you common sense. Use it. And use it in accordance with the faith God has given you. Realistic humility. Now this is important stuff. God wants us to be objective. God wants us to be honest. And God wants us to be realistic in our assessment of ourselves. We do not have to beat ourselves over the heads and say, oh, what worthless worms are we? I used to be in a church environment where there was almost a pride in who could be the most humble and who could berate themselves the best in front of other people. And James's dad used to have a saying, they are proud to be humble. And I think that sums it up brilliantly. That's not what we are talking about. We are talking about realistic humility. As Christians, we have so many things to rejoice in. We've been adopted into God's family. We have a place and a job to do for him. We have been given gifts, and God expects us to use them. In 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about the church being like a body. All different parts working together in unity, but all doing different but very vital jobs. We have all been given gifts, and God wants us to use them. Romans 12 says this, We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. We have a duty as Christians to look at ourselves and say, what can I do? What can I do to serve God? And do you know what I absolutely love about that passage we've just read? And this struck me so forcibly when we were doing the Alpha course the other week. Some of the important listed gifts are to encourage, to serve, and to give. Never mind all the glamorous gifts that we hear so much about, prophesying and tongues and healing. Just put them to one side for the moment, because we easily focus on what we haven't got. But look at those ones. To encourage, to serve, to give. Can you encourage people? Can you encourage people? Can you serve people? Seeing need and stepping in to help. Can you give of your money, your time and your love? These unexciting gifts are up there with the exciting ones in terms of importance in God's eyes. They matter just as much to God. My old pastor used to tell me a story of a cleaner that worked on the factory floor where he was a manager. It was quite a rough factory. The guys there were pretty uncouth, and he found it as a manager quite difficult to manage the team. But there was a dear old cleaner who had been there for years and years, who came in every day, never pulled the sickie, and was only off when he really had to be, and he swept the floor, and he cleaned, and he was pleasant to everybody, day in and day out. Everybody on that flat factory floor had respect for him. They knew he was a Christian and he lived it out. Now, both that cleaner and Daniel were humbly serving God. Nobody was shouting anything from the housetops about their achievements, but they just got on with the jobs that they were given. Now, don't get me wrong, Daniel was certainly not at all that. He had courage, and he stood up for his faith when he had to, but not in a loud, angry, or pompous way, but instead with a quiet, unassuming strength. It says in Daniel 6, verse 3, Now Daniel so distinguished himself 
among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. What he did was not unnoticed. It didn't happen overnight though, but through consistent walking justly, consistent loving mercy, and consistent walking humbly. But in addition to demonstrating the quality of humbleness, Daniel and his friends also demonstrated two other qualities that helped them earn credibility. Respect. They showed respect to their captors. They showed respect in the way they spoke to those in authority, and they showed respect to the jailers. Everyone was shown the same level of respect. They had a respect for attitude and behaviour, which was quite amazing, considering their circumstances. They treated their captors with a profound and a humble respect. Daniel literally lived out the verse, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor, as the supreme authority, or to governors, for it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honour the emperor. And again, the Apostle Paul said, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Now, Daniel served three very difficult kings, all of which had tempers and an aptitude for pride and ignoring God. It was like walking on eggshells working with these guys. They had a hissy fit at the slightest thing. They could change their mind on a whim and put his life and that of his friends in danger. And they did it on more than one occasion, as we've seen. These were not easy people to like, and they certainly weren't easy people to show respect for. But the respect and humility our good guys showed won over at least two of these kings before they died, so that they acknowledged God as the one true God. But it didn't happen overnight, as I've said before. It was consistent humility and respect, day in, day out, day in, day out. And it should be like that for us as Christians. Now, some Christians might think it's wrong to show respect to a government they didn't vote for. Whether we like the party or not, the Bible is clear. God put them there. We might not like it, and we don't have to say we agree with them, but we should show respect. Remember what Paul says, the authorities that exist have been established by God. God has put them there. Now, some Christians might think it's wrong to show respect to those that are blatantly anti-God, including governments, that if they do, they are endorsing them in their sinful values. God says we should love the sinner, not the sin. Look at Daniel. Daniel genuinely showed respect and cared for his captors. When he had to tell Nebuchadnezzar the meaning of one of his dreams, he was sad, I mean really sad, because it was bad news for Nebuchadnezzar. And he said this, My Lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries, he genuinely cared about this guy. He genuinely cared about someone who had enslaved him, who'd taken away all his dreams. Let me ask you a question. Do you care about your bosses or those you work with? Do you show them respect, even when they are foul-mouthed and difficult to work with? Do we bad-mouth the authorities at every opportunity, often in a very detrimental way? Just look at the sum of comments that people make on Facebook. They are not dignified, and they are not respectful. As Christians, we're called to be better than that. We are called to be better than that. Showing respect is easy to say, but not so easy to do, especially when folk really get on your wick. But Daniel went a step further. He not only showed respect, he showed loyalty, and was prepared to stand up and defend the king when necessary. It says in Daniel 11, I took my stand to support and protect him. I tell you what, that must have taken some doing. But that 
type of behaviour doesn't go unnoticed. I've heard it said before, before you become a Christian, the world has one eye on you. When you become a Christian, the world has two eyes on you. So Daniel and his friends showed humility and respect to gain credibility. But they also demonstrated one other specific quality. God-centred persuasiveness. God-centred persuasiveness. Daniel and his friends made a conscious effort to bloom where they were planted. They didn't spend the years of their captivity wishing they were someone else, or they were somewhere else. They decided to bloom where they were planted. Jeremiah told the captives when they went into Babylon, seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Pray for the people who had taken them out of their homes. Pray for the people who had stolen their dreams. Pray for the people who had enslaved them. But that's exactly what they did. They didn't treat their captors as enemies, but instead used their humility and respect and gentle persuasiveness to do what had to be done, what God wanted them to do. <clears throat> when Daniel and Co refused to eat non-kosher food, he was not only humble, but he also approached the situation with sound logic and reasoned with his captors. He basically said, let's give it a go, and if it doesn't work, then fair enough. If we are to gain credibility and shine as lights in this world, we shouldn't approach situations or problems with a bull in a china shop approach. If you go in all guns blazing, you are simply going to antagonise everyone and defeat the whole object of what you are trying to achieve. When I worked as a customer services manager, we had a particularly difficult IT team that was very obstructive when working on projects and they often drank their heels. Many departments would complain about them. But I always had a very good relationship with them. Why? Giant chocolate chip cookies. Giant chocolate chip cookies. Whenever I had a meeting with them, I would bake. And sure enough, the first item on the agenda would be, have you brought any your cookies with you? It was amazing that what giant chocolate chip cookies could actually achieve. Now, I'm not suggesting that we all go home and bake in an attempt to convert gates in. But, I am suggesting that we learn to show love. Show compassion and a gentleness of spirit to those we are trying to witness. So that even when they are obnoxious and living lives contrary to God, we can win them over. If we go around being militant and hard-nosed about things, quite frankly, in this day and age, all we're going to do is put people's backs up. Now, don't get me wrong, I am not saying that we shouldn't stand up for what is right, nor am I saying we should water down the gospel so that it doesn't offend anyone. That's not what I'm saying at all. But what I am saying is it's how we say what we say that matters. On a survey about good communication, it was shown that people often don't remember what you say. They remember how you made them feel. They don't remember what you said. They remember how you made them feel. Trust me, a gentle, loving approach has got to win hands down every time. I loved what Paul Reed said away when we were away at the weekend away. He said, making people belong first, then sort the other stuff out afterwards. Make them feel they belong first. Non-Christians, whether in authority or colleagues, neighbours or friends, are not the enemy. They are victims of the enemy. People all around us are leading messed up and broken lives. Christians make a mess of things. Do we write them off and say, they're doing X, Y, Z, can't handle that? Love, compassion and persuasiveness are what we should display. Remember, victims of the enemy, not the enemy. We should witness with love and leave God to do the rest. Remember what it says in 2 Timothy 2. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, 
not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. When I used to live at my old house, we had a uh, either side of us. The children that we used to call one side nice next door and the others nasty next door. In fact, when talking about the old house, they still use the same description. One side was particularly difficult and would complain about everything, even resorting to throwing things into our garden. Each time there was an issue, I would try to ignore it or act as a peacemaker. I have always hated conflict of any sort. One day, shortly before I sold the house, the nasty next door rang the doorbell and I opened it. She took one look at me and burst into tears. I have that effect on people. <laughs> um, and she said, my husband's been having an affair and he's just left me. Now this is a woman who has been antagonistic on a level you couldn't imagine. So I invited her in and I just talked to her. Needless to say, since we've moved, the nice next door never sends me a Christmas card. This lady sends me a Christmas card every year telling me what's going on in her life, and I send her a letter back telling her what's going on in mine, and we've kept in contact. But I was in that house for nearly 15 years before we had a breakthrough. It took time. And it's actually the same in our new house. I live in a cul-de-sac, and it's a very friendly one. Everyone says hello to everybody else. But there's one man who resolutely will not smile at me. And I go out in the morning to work and I go, Hello, morning! I get this stony face for, yeah, right. But I tell you what, I'm going to make him smile before I move. <laughs> if it kills me, I'll make him smile. So having heard all of this, and having seen how Daniel and his friends won credibility in a hostile environment, they showed it through doing realistic humility, demonstrating respect, and God-centred persuasiveness. What difference is what we've learned today going to make to you and me? I want you to look deep into your heart. Let me ask you a question. Are you a credible Christian? Are you a credible Christian? What do people say about you? Do they even know you're a Christian? Have you searched your heart honestly? To find the gift that God has given you, just you, so you can serve him. No matter how small a gift you think that might be. Remember, God only made one of you. And he made you just as he wanted. Unique and ready to serve him. Do you show humility or do you like to take credit for things? Do you put others first? Do you have a servant heart? Do you seek to reflect God's love and mercy to all? All, no matter who they are, or what they have done, or what they are still doing. Do you always have to have the last say? And as I ask the band to come back, I want to leave you here and hold this verse in your heart through the week and over the coming months so that you could be a credible Christian. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Shall we just quickly pray? Dear Lord Jesus, I pray that you would make each one of us here a credible Christian. Let us be credible in the sight of this world, Lord, so that we can witness for you. I pray for each one of us to be given a realistic humility of heart, Lord. I pray for us to show respect and I pray for courage to demonstrate God-centered persuasiveness. We ask this in your name. Amen. This is the end of this message. We hope you enjoyed it. If you want to find out more about our church, please visit www.chowdean.org.uk. 
please take a minute to rate our podcast on iTunes. 